slow today. It's all that all those meetings we were in earlier on. Yay! You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, Will Murphy. <laughs> I can't compete with that. This looks like a different kind of webinar, the way this is going. Got a shopping channel. <laughs> no, we are live. We are live. You've Good only evening. got five of these left. <laughs> I'll have one, Will. you got four now. Give you a good price. Give you a good price. Good evening, everybody. This is just um, a fun Friday. I think everybody's uh, going a little bit loopy, but why not? Welcome back. Hope you had a fantastic week. You will see that we have the usual Carl Horton, Will Hello. Murphy and myself. And you'll see that we are also joined by Gary from Professional Dental Indemnity. Gary, thank you so much for joining us Pleasure. this evening. We're going to look forward to having a chat with you. Uh, what we normally do is have a little debrief and find out how the scallywags have been getting on this week. So we'll go to the first scallywag, Will Murphy. How's your week been? Uh, yeah, I've had one of those weeks where you look at your diary and you think, ah, not too busy. I'll probably have a bit of time to do some admin and, you know, get some stuff done and it all looks fairly chilled. And then by the time you get to Friday, you feel like you've been run over by a bus. You know? <laughs> um, oh. I think it's just sometimes you, you see these sort of spaces and then all of a sudden it's all getting filled and it's kind of, you know, so probably just, yeah, a lot of clinical work, a lot of implant stuff, um, some big cases down in Harpenden, like a bilateral sinus graft where, mm. you know, you're sort of ready for your lunch and a lie down after that, aren't you? So, um, <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, pretty good. No complaints at all. So, Do you yeah. know what, Will? It's funny what you should say because before, I'd imagine as a practice principal and owner, when you see gaps and spaces in the book, like you say, you know, draw breath, come on, what can we mm. do to efficiently book? You all of a sudden get used to having a few gaps in the book and you work with those gaps and now they're getting filled again. It's like, oh, I don't know. If I, like I know, them. I know. You sometimes get a moment because obviously we've all been like – fully at it haven't we you know full beans since we came out of the first lockdown mm. and so to see a few little gaps I was just kind of like oh yeah actually <laughs> quite nice you know quite like that so um <laughs> but yeah it just doesn't materialize in the end you know so before you know it you you know you're all togged up and <laughs> elbows deep in saliva and off you go so uh, <laughs> so but on that actually we I've just been speaking to um uh software of excellence and I think other other software is available for for dentists <laughs> um about online booking so this is something that you know trying to trying to get with the the modern times you'll be buying a scanner next mate <laughs> <laughs> maybe, Gently, maybe. maybe. <laughs> so you're gonna uh, get it branded so that's uh, yeah, that's that, that's my week. So pretty full, busy, and yeah, I was ready for that first beer. Yeah, oh. excellent. What about your week, Carl? Yeah, little little different. Um, kind of lots of admin going on this week. I mean, today's been a a, a webinar a webinar day from I start think. to finish. I think they had a little pause, um, but you're all good stuff. All, all very interesting. Setting up the uh, the charity. Um, fundraiser so which that, one would that be Carl <laughs> that'd be the mouth cancer awareness one. Oh, would the... that be on Monday the that, 23rd of November that, that's the one oh, yeah okay. yeah so three panel three experts on the panel and yourself obviously hosting it um raising a little bit of money for mouth cancer awareness so that's yeah. that should be good uh lots of interest already so yeah. do book because it's limited places so you know we can we can only host I think a thousand um and we've got a lot of places already gone getting a bit nervous about it even though i'm not on it but um, <laughs> so that was one i was actually uh paid a visit to the nhs on what day was it thursday okay. and I, i've got to say actually um i was chatting away to the people that were looking after me and uh they they've had not much difference apart from the face-to-face -face stuff they were saying that when they were doing my little consultation that the only difference is they've got to wear masks and the rest is all the same. I got a nice tuna sandwich and a cup of coffee at the end of it, which I thought was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> no. which, 
Yeah, really, really got looked after. I, I, absolutely delightful service. Um, you know, really nice. I had a little bit of sedation, so um, you know that was that was interesting. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't be able to remember it, but I do remember it. Do you? Yeah, I do actually. Uh, I've had sedation before, and for some reason, I, I tend to have a very good recollection of, of what's gone on. I don't, uh, you know, that, uh, well, I, you think you do, but I think, you know, yeah, <laughs> well, all the bad things you've done. <laughs> well, a long time ago, we were we were doing some over at Russell's Hall Hospital, and um, the girl that was being sedated um, started talking about the cannabis that she was taking, and uh, said, "But don't tell my mom. Don't tell my mom." <laughs> yes so you do I, I imagine you do say all sorts when you're uh when you're under but anyway that's that's uh been my a little bit like yours i thought i had a day that uh was going to be a little bit quiet so i'd got some little bits planned uh during that and it, and it rapidly got filled and at the end of it uh yeah i i, I well i had a coffee but uh, yeah <laughs> I, I was like whoa, whoa. yeah oh that was a day that was a day and a half but yeah, yeah. Why? All good. So, Gary, as as we've said, thank you so much for joining us this Pleasure. evening. Um, we've we've had a little chat prior to coming on here. Um, we would very very much like uh, you just to give us an insight of uh, your company, what it stands for, um, the effect it's um, yeah. had, obviously during lockdown. Um, no, so straight yeah, sure. over to you. My, my background really is sort of twofold. I've, the last sort of 24 years has been a combination of plastic surgery and uh, medical indemnity. And it was plastic surgery initially that, that led me uh, to medley, medical indemnity. I was working for um, a breast implant company at the time. And we had a, an awful lot of data on failure rates, uh, encapsulation rates uh, and so on. And we were asked by an insurance company for, for the data, which we obliged because the, the data was actually very good. Um, the, the head of the Plastic Surgery Association in the UK also was involved in that project as well at the time. And he essentially raised the question, why am I as a plastic surgeon paying 49 grand for my medical malpractice, given that I've had one claim in, in 24 years? Um, that simple question opened up an enormous can of worms that has really not, not ever had the lid put back on it. Um, Prior to that conversation, there'd, there'd always been three options in the UK, which were the medical defence organisations. I think it was always seen as a, I don't know if I'd say sort of a cartel arrangement, but it was equally unsurprising that all three did exactly the same thing at around about the same level of pricing um, without really much much competition or, or much pressure on them to to do any more than just, just exist and, and, and just take money every year. So several conversations happened with underwriters. We found an underwriter that was prepared to take a bit of a leap of faith, really, into an area that had never really been explored before. And in 2010, we launched the first bespoke insurance-backed indemnity scheme for plastic surgeons. Um, on average, we saved plastic surgeons anywhere between 50 and 65%, which given some were paying 50, 60 grand is, is a phenomenal amount of money. Mm -hmm. Plastic surgeons talked to anaesthetists, anaesthetists spoke to orthopaedic surgeons, orthopaedic surgeons spoke to urologists. Before we knew it, we found ourselves inundated with people from all specialties saying, what about me, what about me? Um, jump forward six years, that company was and still is the largest provider of uh, insured indemnity in the UK to surgeons in private practice. It's now got over 3,000 consultants on its books. Just about that, time, that same time, about 2016, we did look at dentists because we felt that clearly there's a lot more dentists in the UK in private practice than there are surgeons, probably three, maybe four times that number. What, what we found in around 2015, though, was that your premiums at that time were actually relatively low, um, around about a two to three grand mark and fairly stable. But very soon after that, they started to rise. Now, we don't believe that there's a coincidence there. We we wholeheartedly believe that so many surgeons left the defence organisations that it put an incredible amount of pressure on the resources of those companies. And therefore, the only way to get slightly more revenue 
is unfortunately to charge the people that are still there a little bit more for what they're already getting. I know all the arguments about there's more claims coming in, this, that and the other, and there's no doubt that there are. But there's also no doubt that when you lose hundreds of millions from what is essentially a bucket of money, you have to look at to replenish it. Uh, and we feel that's one of the reasons why dental indemnity started to go up at that exact time. It's just not a coincidence. So I then moved from the medical indemnity world into the dentistry indemnity world in 2000 and what was it? Mid 2017. And I formed a professional dental indemnity with a dentist. The reason I did that is with my background being in the medical world, I didn't I know my limitations and my, limit, and my experience of dentistry was very, very limited at that time. So I felt that a dentist who was extremely ethical and well-connected was a very, very good partner for me in order to get to the right people and, and to open the right doors that I, I felt we needed to do. So we set up PDI. Um, since then, we've grown massively and rapidly in, in, in a comfortable way. Our ethos is very much that we we don't want to be enormous we don't want to be a faceless organization hence why we love doing these kind of uh, presentations where you can physically see the people that are behind behind the emails behind the letters and so on um we value every single one of our clients we know every single one of our clients um we will we are prepared to drive to devon to do a conversation with one dentist if that's what's necessary because one of the criticisms i think is leveled at defense organizations is i've no idea who they are they send me a letter every year it goes up 25 percent, and i don't know why we, we never, ever want that criticism leveled at us. Um, COVID was difficult for us because we ended up on the end of a very long process of confused dentists, basically, who didn't know whether to follow the chief dental officer, the BDA, CQC, or the government. Mm. So when all those options were exhausted with none of them given a correct answer or, or definitive answer, we had a lot, of, a lot of our clients ringing us up saying, I, I'm, I think I can open, but what do you say as our indemnity company our answer was probably as clear as anyone in the market and we, we basically said right from day one you can open as far as we're concerned we will cover you definitively as we would before covid it's no different to us and our clients found that really really good because the one thing that you guys weren't getting in that period was clarity so we were, we were able to give that, and we were very proud that we did that. We were the first company to give clarity in that regard. Others followed um, weeks, months later, but we were the first to give it. And I'd like to think that the fact that we did encouraged other people to get it sorted as well. So we're a relatively small company in terms of PDI, but we've got enormous resources behind us with um, uh, a broker called uh, Howden, which is, is, is actually the, the mothership of uh, the smaller broker, St. Giles and underwriters in the city of London. So the resources behind PDI in respect of the financial might and the expertise are absolutely vast, much bigger than any defense organization. Um, but we still give that personal approach. I mean, Neil, my business partner, he's out and about talking to dentists all the time, even though he is still a practice owner and a practicing dentist himself. So COVID has been hard because I much prefer to be in a dental surgery, talking to dentists at lunchtime or over sandwiches than I do on a zoom call um but equally it's much better to be on a zoom call than you know just just um not able to to sit there and take questions from dentists as, as well because we get so many queries um there's so much misunderstanding about what we do and what we don't do out there so we very much see our job as an educational job how does your um business model differ say from the traditional indemnity companies who yeah obviously have a reasonably high dental advisor presence. So, yeah. you know, if I think one, I, one of my patients might be maybe a little litigious or something hasn't quite gone to plan, yeah. I can call them up and say, you know, this procedure, you know, the patient I think has got unrealistic expectations yeah. um, and they can talk me through it, send them the notes and so on and so forth. Yeah. Now, I notice you uh, use the word insurance-based, yeah. Does that just mean that when it hits the fan, you just pay up? Yes and no. I mean, there's, there's terms and conditions to any insurance policy, and just just as if you if you crashed your car into a wall when you when, you, when you'd had nine pints, you wouldn't expect your insurer to pay out on the car because they won't. Um, but the fact is that insurance is a legally binding contract. 
Now, we are one of, I think, three countries in Europe, Southern Ireland and Malta being the other two, that even allows any form of discretion in relation to medical indemnity per se. So it's still beggars belief, really, that still the vast majority of dentists in this country are under a system that has discretion written all over its articles of association. Now, what that means is that if you rank the DGU, the uh, DPL or the MDDUS, and I'm, I'm not going to pick any one of the three out because they all work along the same lines, there is a possibility, however small, that they could refuse to take your case. They could also pull out mid-case. They could also pull out right at the end just before there was a payment due to be done. And there's nothing you can do about it. Now, I'm not going to advocate that it happens regular. I'm not going to happen that it's a... I'm sure that's unlikely, though, isn't it? Uh, well, there are some very, very high profile cases where that's happened, Patterson being one of them. The Patterson case with the breast implant was a very, very clear and obvious case as to where the MDU in that case withdrew cover in the middle of the law case because they could. Now, that, that's that's a fact. Now, Patterson covered a very high number of patients. Now, the MDU for a period of, I think it was six years, Oh. did have an insurance policy behind them. Now, the patients that fell under the insured years, the MDU defended because that was a legally binding contract. The patients that didn't fall under those years, the MDU withdrew cover. So we couldn't give a clearer example as where the defence organisation can exercise its discretion. So it does happen. It does happen. I'm not going to sit here and say it's random. It, it, it's not. And it's yeah. not frequent, but it can happen. The government has issued a paper, I think it was revised in February of this year, that basically said, we we do not want a discretionary system in this country any longer. They, their preference, their strong preference, is for a regulated system. And by regulated, that means insured, because insurance oh. is regulated. So what about the advice side of things? So, yeah. you know, if, if I'm with your company, and yeah. like I said, you know, somebody's not happy with their denture or their implants or whatever. Yeah. Um, who, who do I talk to? I mean, I'd like to say there's, there's a lot more similarities with what we do to defence organisations, and there are differences. We have a 24-hour helpline, just, just the same as our competitors do as well, to be fair, that is manned by highly experienced lawyers that have been doing dental indemnity for 25, 30 years. Yeah. Um, I'm often asked, can I talk to a dentist? And the answer is, of course you can. But we reverse that question and say, well, surely you're ringing with a legal uh, query. Why do you want to talk to a dentist and not a lawyer? And in every single case I've ever dealt with, I've never had anyone talk to a lawyer and come back to me and say, they had no clue what I was talking about, get me a dentist. Um, I have had somebody say to me when I was with the surgical side, uh, I spoke to a surgeon, not being funny, but he didn't know enough about the law to convince me that he was the right person to speak to. So we tend to find, well, we always find, that highly experienced lawyers who will understand everything you're talking about, they're much more aggressive than dental advisors. And the reason they're more aggressive is they know the law better and they've been in a court of law. So if you're speaking to someone that's been in a court of law and defended a case, they are much more likely to be able to say, do you know what, there's no legs in this case, or potentially you're on a sticky wicket here. So we find that the the lawyers are a lot more robust in their approach to dental advisors because they've walked the walk. So, and we like that because I think one thing that most people don't like mm. is the thought that if they if there is a complaint mm. that your defence organisation or your insurer, however it may be, will just roll over and pay out. Because that that's a horrible feeling. Because as a dentist, if you feel you've done nothing wrong, that's somebody basically saying, look, maybe I have done something wrong, we'll, we'll make it go away and we'll pay out. The other thing it does, of course, is perpetuate more claims along exactly the same lines. Because, you know, we know the dental law partnership very well. Uh, they're actually based in the same town as our broker. And we know their modus operandi is simply to throw a lot of muck out the wall and hope that some of it sticks. Now, it will continue to stick if you don't fight back. If you fight back, eventually the dental law partnership has a problem because if they're claiming five grand and they've only got to send one letter to get that, it makes sense for them to do it. If they send a letter and claim five grand and an aggressive lawyer goes back and says, go away, I will fight you. They then have a much more difficult decision to make. Is it worth them fighting that case for that payout? Probably not. So they backtrack. Now we saw this with the surgeons very, very clearly to the point where the, the incident of claim in the first two years halved in the three years after. 
Because when lawyers realised that our lawyers were on the other side of the fence, they backed away because they knew it, even if they won the fight, it wasn't economically viable for them to do so. So it, it is important that you have very aggressive lawyers on your scheme. You don't want some lawyer who's just there to, you know, sympathise and be nice and everything else. You want someone to fight for you. That's really what dentists want, we, we believe. Yeah. I think I think you're probably right because we've had a, a a lovely chap on the panel that was actually telling us that he sort of act he practices very defensively and he's constantly in fear of yeah. of what's going to happen and yeah, me, exactly. me and Will are a bit further down the line and we were kind of saying well you know we're, we're a bit more mature maybe and yeah. well yeah we are aren't we Will there's no getting around yeah, that unfortunately <laughs> yeah <laughs> but the the difference is is that for those younger people coming into dentistry as it is now with, with the litigation and, and working yeah. in an atmosphere in that kind of fear environment. Well, do you think that that's going to change then with this approach? Do you think we're going to bring I, that I, back down? I think, to a, I think it will change, but it will take time. You know, we're, yeah. we're fighting a very long history here. Um, yeah. And I think the added burden that you guys bear in dentistry that just doesn't exist in the medical world is the GDC. You know, you've got a regulator that as soon as I mention it, people pull faces. In, in the medical world with the surgeons, th there's just not that same kind of reaction. I mean, of course, surgeons and doctors are taken to the GMC, but I honestly believe they're far more likely to get a good sane hearing than they are with the GDC. They're also much, much, much less likely to be taken to their regulator because it really doesn't help when the GDC put an advert in a paper basically saying, if, if you've got an issue, why here sort of thing. I mean, that, that beggars belief, but the medics don't have that. So I think the, the environment that you guys are under, where there's a reasonable amount of self-pay, there's a reasonable amount of high expectation, you've got a regulator that seems to be fighting against you, not with you, and you've got God knows how many ambulance chasers just throwing muck at you, it's extremely difficult for young dentists to come in and practice not just freely, but in some ways to explore the boundaries. You know, it stifles innovation. This, um, th this whole situation that we're in now. So, you know, will we change the world with it? No. Will we improve it? I, I wholeheartedly think we will, yeah, but it will take time. Mm. What, what do you think? I mean, I, I hear some of the things that um, there's a very... It's very difficult for some people, I think, if they're thinking of changing, to change, if you've been with an organisation for yeah, 20 years. Yeah. So I, I know because we've had our conversations, um, the reasons that I changed, and, and you've brought those up and you've discussed those. But for me, that, that change was a fairly simple and straightforward change, albeit, yeah. you know, it was like a divorce. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, but the, there wasn't that mutual kind of uh, feeling, I don't think. It wasn't uh, for, no, for no reason. I hadn't done anything wrong, but it certainly wasn't. There wasn't the please stay kind of uh, thing coming no, up. No, no. Um, which was a shame. I would have liked that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it would be nice. Hey. You've probably, well, you've, you've probably paid them 50 grand, so you'd expect to be a bit of a fine. Yeah. yeah. Did you say um, you, not me? To uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but the, it's, I think the, one of the reasons is these organisations are absolutely huge. I think, I think the yeah. NPS, which is the mothership of the dental protection, has got over 200,000 members. So, you know, it, it's very you, – you could ring that organisation 20 times and still not get the same person. Um, if you're in PDI, you'll get me, you'll get Neil, you'll get our broker. You might get one of four people, and that will always be the case. So, you know, we know our clients. We did not lose a single client in the last four month renewal. So you're talking hundreds of clients, not one left us, which is the best endorsement we can possibly have. I mean, I must admit, I think what you did with the COVID was really good because I, I was Thank you. Um, not feeling that great. I was in bed at the time because I. I caught it, as everybody knows, because I've banded that around quite a lot. Um, and I did notice that you'd, you'd done that. What you also did was reduced your, your fees as well, uh, which was great. It's something the GDC didn't do. But yeah. um, oh. I shouldn't say stuff like that. Sure, I might be, might be speaking to you soon, mate. Um, <laughs> so you did that as well, which I, th which I, I thought was admirable because you'd already um, – your, your premiums are certainly competitive to then also become even more competitive – by sort of understanding the the struggles that we were all going through mm. during indemnity it was great well, I, I thought i think it does help that my business partner is a dentist you know yeah I mean, yeah well i know neil he was I, in the same year as me wasn't absolutely. he so oh, and right. he, well, he's, I mean, a, he's a stand-up chap he's a very stand-up chap and the amount yeah. of hassle and trauma i saw that guy go through you know yeah. you, can't, you can't just 
ignore that. I mean, you know, whether he was my business partner or whether he was just, he was, a, 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 I say just a client, but a, a client, it doesn't matter. You know, we, we, we were very aware that dentists more than any area we felt were getting a, a proper kicking, um, not just on the basis that you, you couldn't open, but you weren't getting good advice. You weren't getting any support. And we I, just morally, I, I don't understand how any organization can, can just sit back and go, now to do with us uh we're, we're certainly not built that way you know as people or as a company yeah i mean it was good to know that you sort of had our backs as well when we were going to go back to work because one of the things you did that the problem is the places where i worked they're not with you so, so they, <laughs> they, they were they weren't getting back as quick uh, and one of yeah. the things they were actually saying is well we just don't know where we stand whether we're going to be protected at, with our indemnity yeah. and and I just went, well, I am. So, you know, just open the doors and I'll go in and we'll start working. That's fine. I mean, the irony yeah. is, the, the, the I think the thing to remember, and this just goes for, you know, if, if this situation worsens and happens again, it, the insurance policy, as, as we said right at the start, is a legally binding wording. Now, one of the most, the, the relevant part of that policy, really, that relates to COVID was that we, as a, as a general rule, and this applies pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID, we do expect you as professionals to adhere to all the rules and regulations that govern your profession. Now, someone could easily say to me, well, we didn't know what they were. Well, you then default back to the reasonable man test. You know, what would a reasonable person do in order to open his practice? Well, he'd get, he'd get PPE, he'd look at his processes, he'd put protocols, which is perfectly reasonable. That's, that's pretty much what every single dentist did. Now, if you're not going to do that, in other words, you don't, you're not going to wear PPE, you're not going to have anything... Uh, new in terms of the way the, the, the waiting room is laid out, then of course you're breaching the, the wording of the policy, but you're also not doing the best for your practice and your patients. But if you are, of course, which the overwhelming majority of dentists did, of course the policy will respond because you're behaving exactly as any underwriter would expect you to behave as a dentist in what are extreme and unique circumstances. So the wording of the policy never actually changed. It never morphed, it never altered to accommodate COVID. So in many ways, the policy was utterly unchanged and the approach of the insurers, certainly our insurers, was utterly unchanged right the way through. The difficulty the was insurance you, is that when you talk about insurance is that sometimes there can be a bit of an image problem. Uh, I, I agree. I agree. Insurance companies, because there's always a feeling that one, um, the insurers are going to be sort of pouring through the small print to just see if they can chuck you out of it. Yep. For example, business interruption insurance. Um, yep. I'm sure there's all sorts of class action going on about that at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and also once you've made a claim, does that then hit your premiums for following years? And the final bit is, do your premiums change depending on what you do? So if I'm doing sinus graft and so oh, I was going to ask that question. Too late, yeah. I asked it. <laughs> <laughs> all, all perfectly relevant and normal questions, guys. The first one, I, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, look, look, before I came into the insurance world, I, I had exactly the same questions as you did, Well, exactly the same. You know, do you pay out? Because if I'm going to go and sell your product, I need to know you'll back me up. I need to know you'll back the client up, not just me. And I can honestly say, in I, I've dealt now with, I worked out the other day because I'm a bit anal like this, I've dealt with well over 5,000 medics. I have not seen an underwriter once refuse to pay out unless it was a categoric breach of the terms and conditions of the policy. Categoric. So there was no wriggling, there was no manoeuvring to try and get away with it. I think one of the reasons is, it's a, it's a very distinct class of businesses. It's what's called a personal line. It's it, it, we are very conscious, and insurers are very conscious. They're not insuring a building, a ship, or a house, whatever. They're insuring a career, potentially. And the it's seen as the creme de la creme really, the right fight to get into medical malpractice. It's a very very specialist area, and certainly in our experience, and this is why I think our experience is, is absolutely critical in this because we have dealt with underwriters for a long time. We cherry pick who we deal with. If there's any element of we don't feel they're experienced enough or they're aligned with us, we won't use them. We can go to any one of about 14 insurers. You know, we we choose who we go to. So I agree with you about the image of insurance. You know, it's like, you're right, business interruption insurance. Although to be fair, if you scrutinize the wording, some of the wording is very, very clear and payouts have been made. Some of the wording is very clear and payouts have not been made. 
the problem ones are where the wording is not very clear and that really does bring it right back down and an experienced underwriter will have a wording that is absolutely clear what it covers and what it doesn't because nobody wants gray areas nobody wants to have that conversation um i totally agree with you i've seen all the words in for business interruption and the ones that are a problem are the ones where it is well you're filling in gaps basically and you should not be filling in gaps with an insurance policy it should be absolutely black and white that's the whole that's that's what we sell we sell certainty that that's a big that's a big plus of insurance so i think that really just boiled back to the the quality of the policy and the quality of the underwriters um second thing you asked me there was if i get a claim does my premium go up i'm not going to sit here and say if you have a load of claims you, your insurance will stay the same because that's just patently untrue what it is though is a lot more fair because the best example I've ever given is, is always the one bizarre from the first 10 cases that I ever came across. The first 10 people that applied way back when in the medical world were all plastic surgeons. The first nine had seven claims between them. The 10th had 37 on his own. Now, the 10th was paying pro rata, depending on his income, exactly the same as the previous nine. Now, that is patently unfair patently unfair no one will ever convince me that that guy should not have been paying five times what the others were and probably more now we rate everybody on their experience on their profile on their background in other words education we rate them on what they do we rate them on what they don't do and we also rate them on their on their claims history because we ask for a claims history from every single person that applies if you applied to us and you had eight years with a claim maybe two claims which is unfortunately the law of averages these days and you've got a claim in the first year we would not look at that and go oh my god you suddenly become a bad dentist let's put your price up we look at that and and, and, and apply common sense and say well you might go another three years and not get a claim because your record suggests that's that's what will happen so we only change the pricing if there is a pattern that develops in other words if you've got four claims in a year one we'd be happy with not to increase your pricing on the back of that but two we'd also ask why what's happened why have you got a flurry of claims because we weren't expecting that so we're far more inclined to try and help you find what the problem was and eradicate it than we are just to beat you up about it i've, I've just this today dealt with a surgeon funnily enough who has got arguably one of the worst claims records i've ever seen but i think where he's been let down is that that claims record has been left to continue no one has actually said why are you getting all these claims? What's going wrong? I, I can see what's going wrong. I think his, I think his consultation process is, is, is abysmal. So his consent process is just not there. So everyone's getting him on the basis of consent. Now, helping him will not just mean that patients don't have a problem. It will mean that insurers don't have a problem. And importantly as well, he won't have a problem going forward. So yes, he's having to pay through the nose for it, unfortunately, because of all these claims, but we want to improve that. We want to get his price down by helping him to stop him getting claims in the future. So I, I feel defence organisations, because of their size, are very black and white. We see members that have been given a, a, a two weeks notice to leave. I'm sorry, your claims record doesn't fit our profile. Go and find somebody else. I don't think that's the right way of doing it. I think if you do get a flurry of claims, find out why. What is going on? Try and help the, try and help the dentist. If a dentist doesn't want to be helped and just keeps making claims at some point, yeah, of course, an insurer will say, we can't insure you anymore. But only if it's not a two-way street in the communication process. Yeah, that's good. Oh. I mean, that's a little bit like the old PASS system that the LDCs used to have. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a is, nice Is system. that right? Okay, yeah. 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 I mean, it, to me, it's common sense, Carl. Um, you've got to have resources to do it. You've got to have the ability to look at a single case and apply that time and effort to it, which I think is where... I, I believe the defence organisations struggle because it's too automated. You know, if you if you flick over a certain percentage of loss, all of a sudden you're 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 automatically enrolled in an adverse member scheme, um, and I, it, it's it, it's just too impersonal. Um, it, it could be anything. It could be something in your private life. It could be that you've moved practice and fell out with your previous principal, who's now dumping a lot of cases at your door. It could be any number of circumstances which do not say you are in any way clinically any worse than you were last year. And a dentist, so uh, of it, uh, retrospectively, say they stay with you for a year and then move on to somebody else, and there's a claim from that year whilst they were with you, uh, are they yeah. covered 
that. It, it totally depends which, which system they're on, Will. We, 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 I think we're unique. We sell claims made and claims occurred. Claims occurred, the liability stays with the insurer in, in perpetuity. So, in other words, if you were with us for 10 years on claims occurrence and you left and reported 20 years later, the insurer would still pick it up, yes. The other system is claims made. With claims made, a little bit like a relay race. So if the baton was the claims, as you move from one claims made insurer to another claims made insurer, that baton is, is handed across. So all the liability stays with the current insurer, not the previous ones. Just two different systems. Um, some people prefer claims of current, some people prefer claims made. I, I see advantages of both, if I'm honest with you. Um, there's a big fight on Facebook between two of my competitors, one slagging off occurrence, one slagging off claims made. We're sort of in the middle going, do you know what? I can see advantages of both. So we offer both and we explain what each one does and you can make your own choice for intelligent people. Um, one of the other things that we sort of asked was the, the difference that you could have if you were, say, just doing implants, solely implants, or implants with sinus lifts, block grafts. Yes. Or if you're just limited to um, endodontics or a general dental practitioner that's not doing the implants. And do you tailor that to the individuals? We, we do. Um, and what I don't want to do is just say, oh, implants is high risk. It'll cost you a lot more. It's, it's, it's not as simple as that. Um, yeah. You know, you could argue that someone who only does implants and therefore is pretty narrow in what he does, or she does, of course, is, is a much better risk than someone who does a bit of this, a bit of that, and a bit of that. Um, I mean, certainly, I, 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 we see from experience that medics, and I mean any medic, whether it be a dentist or a surgeon, that, that does has a very broad practice, they do tend to get more claims. You know, if, if you're just doing stuff that is risky, but that's all you do, you become an expert in it, like like in any walk of life, and therefore you get more you get more expertise at it because you get more experience and more practice at it. So it's not as simple as you do implants, therefore it's going to cost you five grand more than if you don't do implants. It really does depend on also the training that you've got, the support network that you've got, um, and the experience that you've got. So yeah. it's it, it's not it's not an exact well it is an exact science from an underwriting perspective, but it's not a very simple statement for me to say implants equals five grand more than non-implants it doesn't work that way at all i like to think we apply common sense to it we we tend to follow the arguments that you guys would probably fire at us uh, i mean our job really is to get you the client the best deal with the insurer you know we're not we're not aligned to any insurer we can choose who we want so most of our day is not having a fight with insurers, but certainly making the case as to why we think your price should be lower or the excess should be lower or your terms should be better. Um, and we're quite happy to pair, uh, to pair underwriters off against each other. We've no problem with that. What about uh, advice that might be non-clinical? So, so sort of things like sort of GDPR issues or contract issues. Do you, do you help with that as well? Yeah, or is... absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, all the law firms we work with, they're, they're multifaceted. So yes, of course, we expect you picking up the phone line to... Uh, uh, a dental a lawyer but all the law firms have got um, very specialist uh, contract lawyers in place they've got a, like, like you say cyber is, 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 a, is a massive one at the moment you know we're getting all sorts of calls about what can I do what can't I do do I need to back up how often how frequently it's 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 all in the melting pot of this it's much broader advice than it was uh, several years ago even you know yeah. even, even things like reputational damage that that's coming into the equation now with you know people plastering bad reviews on facebook and and doctifying places like that you know we, that was unheard of 10 years ago and all of a sudden now it's becoming a it's a real hot potato what do i do if so the advice the lawyers give is is a lot broader and and yeah of course we we've morphed to uh to, to pick that up and and i, I know we, we talked about this how about the the sort of the the other dental side of things so your dentists so you branch out towards the hygienists and the therapists Yes, is that something yes, you, you, yes, is, you're doing right. that or are you looking at that? Already doing it. We've introduced um, a fixed price for hygienists, uh, one for full-time, one for part-time. And we've introduced a fixed price for therapists as well. They're both on the website already. Excellent. Fantastic. Well, boys, I hate to tell you, but no we way. are the magical time. <laughs> oh God, if I consume the whole time, I do apologise. No, no, don't apologise. It was, it was ex excellent. Absolutely no, no, no. excellent. I'm just going to ask if uh, anybody else has got any questions. Have you got one of these, Will? 
Oh. <laughs> that, that goes in here. That goes in here, Will. Ready? Oh. <laughs> and you're one of them and one of Will's mugs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to my game. <laughs> uh, seriously, Gary, that has been absolutely fantastic. And I'm sure that you've helped um, a lot of people out there and certainly um, answered some questions. It was really informative and it's really clear to see that you're very passionate about yeah, the personal touch that that your company provides yes so i am i am and, and neil is as well you know neil's one of the nicest people i've ever met and he, he takes everything so personally which is a good thing really well it, it it shines through with your company so thank you so very much for your My pleasure time. yeah thank, thank you. you thank you guys mr murphy mr horton thank you as always um hope yeah, you all... i was quiet tonight how about that for a change you were yeah. i think will's in shock <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <Will. laughs> that was. I think, mic, I think your mic had gone off or something. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, guys, thank you very, very much. Ah, brilliant. And I hope yeah. you all have a lovely weekend. Cheers, all. And you. Take care, Kate. Thanks a lot. Take care, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.